the principles we're going to be talking about tonight uh, have the potential of saving you a whole lot of heartache and grief and conflict in your uh, marriage and relationship, hopefully, to come. So, um, and, and then maybe there's some of you, by the way, that you come in here and you're like, I don't fall in either one of those camps. Like, like I've been there, done that, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's not, not in my future anytime soon. Hey, hey, listen, if that's you, um, I don't believe that God has you here by accident. Uh, I think that God can even use a, a message uh, around the concept of marriage uh, to speak some truth into you that, that has the ability to really transform a lot of your life, a lot of your situation. In fact, oftentimes when Jesus would uh, speak about our relationship with God, growing our relationship with God, uh, he would oftentimes use this imagery of marriage, uh, the, the marriage relationship to uh, kind of express, you know, ways we can really grow, ways we can really deepen our walk with God. And so, um, so we're going to kind of jump into a story that that I kind of started off uh, speaking about on week one, and uh, we just kind of glanced over it in the first week, but I want to kind of come back to it and really unpack it. And it's um, a story in Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, and this is sort of um, maybe in all the Bible, maybe the greatest story of sort of unmet marital expectations in the entire Bible. And, uh, and yet, in the kind of this crazy story, I think there's a lot of truth that we're going to, to find uh, from this. And in fact, um, you know, we, we don't know a whole lot about this kind of story. It's a story basically of this kind of strange little love triangle between Jacob and Rachel and Leah. And, and again, you know, we don't know a whole lot in terms of where this um, love triangle kind of took place. Um, a lot of scholars um, believe it took place in kind of modern day, somewhere between Kentucky and Alabama. So I don't, uh, you'll get that here once you hear the story, you'll, you'll really get that. So we're going to dive right in. Genesis 29, verses 16 through 17. It says, that now Laban had two daughters. Um, the name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Um, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. So, um, so here, uh, Jacob, is he's kind of journeying, and he's walking around, and he spots these two daughters, and he sees Leah, Leah, and the description for Leah is that she has weak eyes. That's just really a nice way of saying that she's not going to be entering the Miss Alabama beauty pageant contest anytime soon. Um, but, but Rachel, on the other hand, Rachel was beautiful. Rachel was gorgeous. And Rachel was the one who caught his attention. In fact, we see this in verse 18. It says, Jacob was in love. It was love at first sight, right? He was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. All right, so, so shocker, Jacob's in love with the, the hot one, the gorgeous one. Some of you ladies are like, man, right? And just, man, go figure. And uh, it goes on, it says, uh, Laban, um, you know, Rachel's dad, said, it's better that, that I give her to you than some other men. Stay here with me. And so uh, it goes on, verse 20, it says, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And all the ladies said, ah, isn't that the most, isn't that like the most romantic story? And you know, if the story ended there, it, it would be like one of the great Hallmark stories of all time, right? Like, I mean, put a bow on it, you know. I mean, here's Jacob, sees the love of his life, and goes up. He's like, I'll work seven years for you. And she's like, you had me at hello. You know, I mean, it's like it's perfect, right? It's a fairy tale. And yet, unfortunately, reality would eventually come to set in on this story. And... Um, and it's sort of the reality side of this story uh, that I want us to really unpack. And it's, it's in this kind of second half of the story that we see five expectations, five expectations that I can tell you will never go unmet in a marriage. Five expectations you can take to the bank that if you, when you get married, if you get married, if you're already married, five expectations that will never go unmet. And and I'll pre-warn you, some of these expectations uh, might at first seem a little discouraging. <laughs> it might seem, uh, so speaking of grading expectations, might kind of feel like fingernails on a chalkboard a little bit. Uh, but I'm telling you, if you stick with me on this, on the other side of these grading expectations 
is a great G-R-E-A-T expectation you can have for your marriage when God gets involved. And so, uh, so kind of jump into this. Here's the first um, expectation that will never go unmet in a marriage. And that is that it won't work out the way you planned. It will not work out the way you planned. So Holly's back there laughing and already <laughs> basically amening under her breath, right? Um, and we see this in this story. And again, this is, this is where the story gets really, really weird. It's like a Jerry Springer episode, um, Genesis 29, starting verse 22. It says, So Laban brought together all the people of the place and, and gave a feast. This is after the seven years that he's worked. You know, he's expecting this amazing wedding and wedding night and all this. And it says, um, so, he, so Laban gets everyone together. They throw this party. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Now, if you're hearing that, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, what just happened there? Like, I thought he was getting married to Rachel. Where does Leah get involved in this? Um, like I said, it's like a Jerry Springer episode. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And, and we don't know what happened here. You know, we, we just know it had to have been one crazy party. Uh, Jacob probably enjoyed himself a little bit too much with some of the beverages and things like that going on. Um, but, but whatever the case was, was that he thought he was marrying Rachel, and instead he wakes up to Leah. In fact, we see this Genesis 29, 25. It says, when morning came, there was Leah. Surprise, right? And so Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Here's what I want you to get from that. Is a, never assume the person you married is the person you're married to. Never assume the person you married is the person you're married to. My wife is laughing way too much at this. <laughs> uh, because... Because the truth is, you know, sometimes, um, you know, if we're really honest, who we think we're, you know, the person we married in comparison to who we're married to, a lot of us, well, when you look at the source of so many of the angst of our, our frustrations from expectations, it's because we're married to a picture. We're married to a picture, a picture of our spouse rather than the reality of our spouse. And it's a picture all of us have, have kind of created in our mind. And, and it's a picture that can cause expectations of our spouse, uh, a tension that comes within that. And it's not from comparing our spouse to ourselves, but we compare our spouse to themselves. Stick with me on this. See, I, I don't compare you to me. I compare you to you. But not the you that's here, the you that I drew. Because before there was ever a you that I knew, there was a you that I drew. And, um, and, and all of us have this. You know, when we grow up, you know, we, we've got a picture of how our marriage is going to be, how our spouse is going to be, what they're going to look like, how they're going to act. And, and before there was ever a holly, I had a holly I drew. And so, um, you know, she had, you know, amazing hair, long flowing hair, well, uh, Beautiful eyes. <laughs> Luscious lips. And uh, let's see here. She was, uh, we'll, we'll put her in a, in a cowboy sweatshirt. Because, you know, she, she has to be a cowboy fan, so... So here we go. That's the holly I drew. I mean, this, this is the holly I had in my mind. I would say, actually, I did better than my expectation in drawing my mind. But we've all got this. And in fact, ladies, before you uh, mock uh, some of our, my drawing and, and some of the, the pictures that us guys have in our mind, uh, you've got a picture, too. You've got expectations when you go into a marriage of how your spouse is going to look, how they're going to act. And, and in fact, yours is a little bit more detailed because, ladies, you love to outdo us in so many things. Uh, in fact, we got a video clip that I think will, will kind of show uh, expectation that I think so many ladies have uh, going into marriage. Take a look. Well, once there was a princess. Was the princess you? And she fell in love. Was it hard to do? <laughs> it was very easy. Anyone could see that the prince was charming. The only one for me. Was he uh, strong and handsome? Was he big and tall? There's nobody like him. 
anywhere at all. Did he say he loved you? Did he steal a kiss? He was so romantic, I could not sound about right? <laughs> the pictures we draw in our mind, and, and, and some of us, if we were to be honest and we look at and maybe some of the, the frustration, some of the tension, some of the angst, some of the conflict in our marriages and our relationship, uh, could it be not so much uh, that it's an issue with our, the reality of our spouse in front of us, but, but it's this tension in comparing them to this picture. We're married to a picture of who they are, who we thought they were going uh, to be. And, uh, and by the way, too, in speaking of that, I want to speak a moment just to, to the singles out here and um, especially encourage you. You know, I think one of the greatest things you can do um, in terms of really setting yourself up for a great marriage is to, when it comes to these expectations, when it comes to these pictures that we kind of create in our mind, and again, we're oftentimes from, from the moment we're kids going through elementary school, middle school, we're forming these pictures and, uh, of Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright. One of the best things we can do is actually right from the get-go before we ever step into the marriage vows is to be upfront about expectations. <laughs> you know, to actually talk about them. In fact, this is actually where Jacob got in trouble. You know, Jacob, as we see when we read this story, he got in trouble because he never took the time to actually talk about the expectations. The expectations he had going into marriage, the expectations Rachel had going into marriage, and even her family. And check this out. Uh, verse 26 says, Laban replied, this is after he wakes up and he's surprised, there's Leah, not Rachel. It, Laban replies, he goes, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Isn't that interesting? The, again, customs, expectations that Jacob didn't take the time to talk about ahead of time. And it got him in so much uh, trouble. And, and reality is in so many uh, relationships, we get to the core of, of so many conflicts in marriage, especially the early years of marriage, it's oftentimes uh, customs that were never talked about. You know, the expectations kind of rooted in these customs that were never discussed. In fact, a lot of the expectations, a lot of the pictures that we paint, we form in our mind of Mr. and Mrs. Wright and how we think our marriage is going to be, start out as kind of customs that were formed in your house. A lot of the expectations you have of your spouse are formed in customs that started in your house. I mean, they, they, they start, think about it, it's like, uh, like, like if you grew up and, and your mom uh, always, you know, uh, cleaned up your room and cleaned up all your stuff, did all of your laundry, and was always waiting there with a cup of coffee for you. It, it can be easy to go into your marriage expecting that same thing from your spouse. You know, and the vice versa, if you grew up and you had a dad who was a, you know, a handyman, constantly able to fix things, repair the car, repair the fence, it, it's easy uh, to be a little more than little bit disappointed in someone like me who all of a sudden you got an issue with the fence and you're like, my dad fixed it. How come you don't, you don't even know how to work a, a screwdriver, right? I mean, you know, and, and so we get these expectations that, that create these conflicts because a lot of times we just don't talk about them up front before we get into the marriage covenant, the marriage relationship. But, but, but you might be sitting there saying, okay, that's great for the expectations I'm aware of, for, for the picture that I know. But, but what do you do uh, about those expectations that maybe we're not maybe quite as keenly aware of? The, the, the pictures in our mind of how we see our marriage going or how we see our spouse acting or, or what they will say or what they'll look like um, and when it doesn't add up to that. How, how, do we, how do we find those expectations? And here's what I've come to find is that oftentimes I become aware of so many of my expectations when, when a spouse, you know, when the spouse fails to meet them and vice versa. And in fact, we kind of see this here in the story. It says, uh, Genesis 29, 25 says, when morning came, there was Leah. When morning came, there was Leah. Now, now before we get too down on Jacob on this, of like, man, Jacob, what's going on here? 
I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, listen, if you're married, every single married person will have a Genesis 29, 25 moment in their life. You, you will. You, you'll have that moment where you're going to, you married Rachel, and you'll wake up and wonder, who is this person? Like, this, this is not who I married. Like, this is, the, you know, like, what happened? Like, like I, I married Rachel, and I'm waking up to Leah. I married Fabio, and now here's Ed, right? You know, and, and, and Fabio, back in the day, like, he was romantic. He was taking the time to, to write cards, write poetry, sing me songs. And now Ed, now I'm married to Ed. I'm waking up to Ed, and you know, his, his version of romance is, is pulling out the crinkled Valentine's card from our, our third grader's lunchbox and, and reusing it on Valentine's Day. I mean, you know, or, or, or we think, you know, on, on the flip side of that, we think, well, what happened to, to, to my wife who once was so spontaneous and so high energy and, and so joyous? And now we have these kids, and, and now she's overwhelmed, and she's exhausted, and she's tired all the time. In fact, interesting enough, you know, the, the name Leah... Leah actually means exhausted, overwhelmed, and tired. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like you're, you know, married this, this spontaneous, vibrant lady, and now, you know, life happens. Kids happen. Seasons change, you know? And, and it, it kind of brings up a, a tendency that for a lot of us, again, when it comes to some of these expectations that lead to frustration, is, is oftentimes they're not just rooted to us being married to a picture, but, but sometimes we're not careful. It can also come about because we're married to a memory. We're married to a memory. Uh, because here's something you've you got to understand. that If you're married to a person, which if you're married, hopefully it's to a person. Uh, you know, you're, not, you're not married to a rock. You're not married to a robot. If you're married to a person, I, the reason I can say that this Genesis 29, 25 moment happens to all of us is because you're human. And, and, and if you're two humans are getting married, hey, listen, humans, people, we change. We change. The person you married 10 years ago is different than the person today. We, we, we change. We, we grow. We, we, we you know, adjust. We, we, we um, d- develop and we mature. And, and listen, I share this with you because I think especially in our day, in our culture, you know, so many people, it's like we're, we're shocked when we see that our spouse has changed. You know, and in fact, so many people, it's like when they, when they, you know, they thought they married Rachel, and then 10 years down the road, they're waking up to a Leah, or they're waking up to an Ed, and, and uh, you know, it can be easy to sit there and think, man, oh, what happened? Like, like spur of the moment, all of a sudden, they changed. I, this is not the same person I, I met. This is not the same person I thought I was marrying. This is not the deal I signed up for. And unfortunately, so many people, they, they end up tapping out in that moment all because they, they, the, uh, the unexpected, or at least what they thought was the unexpected changes in a person. It's like, I, I just don't know what happened. Everything was great. It was like a Hallmark movie, but now what? And, it's, and granted, it's probably not as dramatic, again, as, as one night it's Rachel and the next morning it's Leah. But, but again, people change. Your, your spouse is going to change. And in fact, it's interesting. Um, in that passage, it says, you know, in the morning time, he woke up and saw Leah. In fact, that morning, it's kind of reflective of seasons. You know, there, there's seasons in your relationship. Right? Like, like there's a honeymoon season. There's, there, there's kind of the, the husband-wife season. There's the parenting season. There's the empty nesting season. There's, there, there's going to be changes, and there's going to be time. And, and listen, I share this with you because, uh, listen, if you, if you want to have a marriage that grows, a marriage that's vibrant, a, a marriage that, that, that just doesn't just last, but... But, but is, is, has, has some fulfillment to it, has some life to it. Uh, listen, you've you got you to learn, rather than getting frustrated and holding on to the memories of the picture you had of the perfect spouse, or, or the, holding on and being married to the memories of what was, you've got to learn to embrace the reality of your spouse today, who, who they are today how God has grown them, how God has matured them, how God has stretched them, who they've become today. Listen, uh, this marriage commitment, it's a commitment ultimately to love someone for the rest of your life. It's a commitment ultimately to love you as you change throughout your life, as you change throughout your life. See, I'm not committing simply to love this version of you right now. Hit the pause, take a picture, and be like, I love this picture. I'm committing to, to the whole video. I'm committing to the whole journey. Um, 
I remember um, years ago, I used to have, a, anyone have a flip phone? I remember when those, those were like all the rage, so like pre-smartphone. I, I got this uh, flip phone from um, a pastor, a friend of mine who I was on staff with, and it was great because it was on his plan, so it was totally free. Um, and I loved it. I loved the phone. I mean, I, I loved a good flip phone. And, um, and I remember I, I did everything I could to keep that thing running. Uh, I mean, I put duct tape on it. I had, I had a paper clip for the antenna. And, and I had friends that they would constantly, you know, you know this was, again, this was when smartphones were coming out. And friends that would show me the latest smartphone, the latest, you know, iPhone. And, and uh, they're like, man, you've got to get one of these. It'll change your world. And every time I was like, no, no, no. I'm holding on to my flip phone. I'm going to hold on to this thing until it dies. And, and, and sure enough, eventually it did die. And I got a smartphone. And I remember the, the first time I got a smartphone, I was like, this is incredible. Like all the things I've been missing out on, all the things that I, I, I've avoided because I was holding on to this broken, this cracked, you know, old phone. And listen, I share that because I think for a lot of us, it's, it's, it's kind of a picture of so many marriages and stuff. Um, is that we're holding on to, uh, again, either a picture of our, our perfect spouse or we're holding on to a memory and not embracing who they've become, not embracing the changes, not embracing you know, the beauty of who God is transforming them and who God is growing uh, them uh, to be. In fact, you know, truth is, like, hey, I, I love girlfriend version of Holly. I love honeymoon version of Holly. But I wouldn't trade that version of Holly for today's version of Holly. You know, mom version of Holly, wife version of Holly. I wouldn't trade that in the world, you know, for the world. And so, uh, again, you know, you got to understand, that, listen, listen, people change, and that's not, that's not a bad thing. It's actually something to, to be embraced rather than running from. And uh, here's the second thing, um, again, of expectations that, that you, can, you can take to the bank, um, is that you will have to work on it more than you planned. You will have to work on it more than you planned. Uh, verse uh, 27 through 30 says, uh, Finish this uh, daughter's bridal week, uh, then we will give you the younger one also. So this is after you know, he wakes up to Leah, and this is Laban talking. He says, Hey, finish the daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And I like verse 30. It says, And he worked for Laban, get this, another seven years. See, see going into the marriage, he, he knew that it was going to require some work. He knew it was going to require a, a little bit of effort. He knew it was going to be, be, you know, it was going to take him out of his comfort zone. He was going to have to, you know, be asked to, he was going to have to pick up his clothes every once in a while. He was going to have to hand laundry duty every once in a while. I mean, he knew that. And, and truth is, nobody, like, comes into a marriage or a relationship and doesn't think that there's some work involved. I, I mean, I think everyone gets that there's, there's a little bit of work involved. But, but the problem is, is I think way too often we grossly underestimate the amount of work involved. We grossly underestimate the amount of work involved. And, and listen, if you, want, if you want the kind of marriage where, where you're married to the hot one, <laughs> the, 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 the Rachel one, if you want the marriage that you expected in your mind, the one you drew in your mind, listen, you're going to have to put some work into it. It doesn't just happen. It, and in fact, I, I like this picture because, again, he worked seven years, and then he signed up for another seven. It, in other words, it, listen, he didn't just put work to get his spouse, to attract his spouse. He, he had to put work into keeping his spouse. Yeah, and, and, and listen, the, the, the same goes for us. Uh, listen, if we want a, a marriage that's growing, a marriage that's vibrant, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some effort. And it may sit there think, well, this isn't how I planned it to go. This isn't what I was expecting. You know, again, I, I thought I married Fabio. I woke up to Ed. And, and you know, again, there's, there, there's some of these unmet expectations. But I put it on my notes this way, and I think this is so true, is that oftentimes when, when it doesn't work out, work out exactly how you planned it would, when it doesn't work out is exactly when you need to put work in. When it doesn't work out, when it's not necessarily going the way you expected or you thought, that's actually the time that you and I, we need to put the most work in. Jacob committed to work seven more years. And, and get this, too, because I, I get the pushback like, well, you don't know. You don't understand the strain. You don't understand the argument. You don't understand the hurt uh, in our relationship and, and in our marriage. But, but I find it interesting when Jacob makes this commitment. Because, again, this is after the letdown. 
This is after the disappointment. This is after, I mean, Rachel, the, the love of his life, you know, it seemed like she was almost in cahoots with her, with her dad to, to pull this off. And, and even in spite of that pain, in spite of that hurt, in spite of that wound, Jacob, get this, recommits himself for another seven years, even after the disappointment. Even after the disappointment. And, and, and listen, to me, again, that, that, that's amazing to me. You know, because, listen, look, anyone can commit for the first seven years. Anyone can sign up, you know, when there's the, 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 the feelings, when there's the emotion, when there's the romance, when it feels like a scene from The Bachelor. Anyone can do that. But you know what marriage is all about? Marriage is committing to the second seven. Marriage is saying, hey, listen, hey, hey, even when it gets rough, even when it gets hard, I'm committing to love you you know, for not just the first seven, not when it's all great, not when it's all roses, but even when times get tough and times get hard. Marriage is committing to the second seven years. And, and listen, and, 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 uh, you know, hopefully you understand too, when, when I'm, I'm saying seven, I'm not like speaking specifically seven years. Like, like some of you are like, oh, well, I only got seven more years. I, I think I can hold out till then, you know. Now, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, that, that word, you know, seven, that number, you know, numbers, they have value in, in the Bible. And, and the number seven actually means completeness. It means totality. It, it means going all in. It's, it's going to the finish. And, and, and especially, and I love, again, that, that commitment to another seven years. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, a uh, seven-year itch. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, kind of a lot of different sociological studies have, have kind of shown that, that oftentimes there's a, there's a higher rate of divorce, higher rate of breakup after seven years. Because I think this, I think after seven years is when you really get to know a person. Like after seven years, you, 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 the, the gloss, the shine, the glow, like it's no longer Rachel, it's Leah. You see the real person, the good, the bad, the ugly. And again, marriage, what marriage is, marriage again is not simply a commitment for the first seven. It's a commitment to say, hey, listen, I'm going to knowing the good, the bad, the ugly of you, everything in your life, I'm committing for another seven years. I'm committing to the end. And, and, and don't get me wrong here, too. You know, I'm not, not saying if you're in an abusive relationship that this is, a, you know, well, I just got to tough it out. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, if you're in a, in a relationship that's abusive or um, or, or, or hurtful in that kind of capacity. I mean, you, you need to get out of that. That's not what I'm, I'm saying here. But, but what I am saying is that, listen, I, I think too often we live in a society where when things get tough and things don't live up to our expectations and things don't live up to our, our picture of how we thought it was going to go, when things start to get a little bit rough, it's amazing how many people have decided to throw in the towel and, and, and give up way too soon. And listen, I'm telling you, marriage is a commitment to serve the second seven, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's tough, even, even when the, the person uh, maybe disappoints you. And, and listen, if you're married, your, your spouse is going to disappoint you sometimes. And in fact, Jesus, actually in speaking of this and speaking of the importance of this, um, you know, the, he, he's, uh, he's some of the religious leaders, they, they come and they ask him, and they talk to him, and they say, you know, well, what's the limit, basically, Jesus? Like when it, when it comes to, does this someone saying something wrong or is doing something that hurts me or wounds me? When, when can I throw in the towel? When can I call it enough is enough? And, and, and they go, you know, it's seven times enough. And I love Jesus' answer. No, it's, it's seven times 70. Seven times 70. In other words, no, you, you've got to do a second seven and a third seven and a fourth seven and a 70th seven. You know, that's, that's what marriage is. It, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a covenant. And, and, and again, you know, I, I get the pushback. It's like, well, you don't understand. I mean, they disappointed me. They hurt me. Look, look, look if you're married, there's going to be times where, where your spouse, they, they, they disappoint you. But, but listen, just because they disappoint you, it doesn't necessarily make your spouse a bad spouse. You're probably disappointed because you're married to a human being. And again, human beings, we're, we're going to do those things. We're going to say some things sometimes that, that hurt one another, do some things that hurt one another, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. But, but you're going to be disappointed. And the real question is, what are you going to do then? What are you going to do then? Jacob, he chose a second seven. He chose a second seven. He chose to go the distance. 
Which leads to the third, unmet expectation, or expectation, I guess I should say, actually, that you can count on being met, is that your spouse will never give you everything you need. Your spouse will never give you everything you need. We see this in Genesis 31. It says, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Talk about a little bit of pressure. <laughs> like, like, Jacob, I've, I've got this issue. I've got this need inside me that, that you're not fulfilling. And, and, and I, I need you to take care of this. I, I need you to make me happy. I need you to bring me some joy. I need you to bring me some satisfaction. I need you to bring me some fulfillment. Which leads to the, the fourth expectation that, that you can count on in marriage is that your spouse will always need more than you can give. Your spouse will always need more than you can give. I know some combination, right? Uh, you need some stuff, and they'll never be able to give it to you, and they need stuff, and they expect stuff from you that you can never give to them. And we see this in Genesis 32. Jacob became angry about this. He was frustrated about this. He goes on and says, Am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? And, and so we, we see this tension. We see this frustration. We see this realization both longing for something that the other person could never fulfill and actually was never meant to fulfill. And, and, and unfortunately, by the way, I think we live in a, a time and an age where, where so many people, we get stuck right here. And in fact, this is actually the root of so many divorces is, again, trying to get from somebody else, trying to get from another person a fulfillment and a satisfaction, a happiness, a joy that they were never meant to deliver in the first place. Which, it, which leads actually to kind of the last point. And this is where the, the story starts to turn. Be, because, you know, it could have just ended in catastrophe. It could have just ended in divorce. It could have just stopped right there. But, but Rachel, um, Ra Rachel takes it uh, another route. In fact, I like what she does. In Genesis 30, 22, it says, uh, then, then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her. In other words, Rachel, she was talking with God. She was interacting with God. She, she quit talking to Jacob, and she started to talk to God about her lack of fulfillment, her lack of joy, her lack of satisfaction. And, and so he, it says God listened to her and enabled her to conceive. In other words, again, you know, for most of her time, she was just constantly talking with Jacob, constantly nagging Jacob, like, Jacob, I need this from you. You've got to do this for me. I need you to meet this expectation. But the turning point happens when she shifts her focus on trying to get something from Jacob that Jacob could never give to her. And started to focus on the only one who really could. Started to shift her focus, shift her conversation on the God. Genesis 30, 20, 30 uh, verse 23 says it this way. It says, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And I love this. It says, God has taken away my disgrace. God has taken away my disgrace. Which leads to the last expectation. Listen, you can take to the bank. And this is that you will need God's grace to make it through. You will need God's grace to make through. If you're, if you're going to do this thing, again, first seven, you can do on your own. <laughs> first, first seven, you know, when, when you're dating, the honeymoon years, listen, you know, love, pheromones, episodes of The Bachelor, it can get you through. But if you hope to really you know, live out the marriage covenant, to sign up for a second seven, listen, you can't do that on your own. That, that, that only happens with some supernatural help. That only happens by the grace of God. If you're going to love somebody, not when you don't know them, but when you all the way know them, the good, the bad, the ugly, the struggles, the challenges, you know all about them, which, by the way, is God's love for us. I mean, you realize that, that, that when God you know, came down, when Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't like he, he didn't know what he was signing up for. It's not like he got down here like, whoa, whoa, wait, I didn't sign up for this deal. I didn't know, whoa, I didn't know they had that going on. No, it wasn't that at all. He, he knew everything about us. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus came and died for us. See, it's a picture of his love for you and for me. And, and listen, if you're going to sign up for a second seven, you can't do it on your own. You, you need that kind of grace. You need that kind of supernatural help. Again, I love what she says in verse 23. She says, God has taken away my disgrace. In other words, God did it. God has done this. I couldn't do this by myself. Uh, my spouse couldn't do this for me. I couldn't do this for him. God did it. 
I'd been asking Jacob for some stuff that Jacob could never do for me. I'd been putting expectations on my spouse that they could never live up to because there's some things that, listen, only God can do. In fact, I put in my notes this way, is that there are some expectations that only God can meet. There's some expectations that only God can meet. And listen, the faster you get that, the faster you really hold on to that and you understand that, I'm telling you, the happier you'll be, the more fulfilled you'll be, the more joy you'll find in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships. You know, the, the moment that, that we, we, we quit looking on, hey, you know, she's going to make me happy or they're going to meet all my needs or they're going to satisfy me or they're going to completely, no, no, no. There are some things that only God can do. There, there's a joy, there's a fulfillment, there's a satisfaction that, listen, only God can can pour into you and me. That's found only in a relationship with him. See, I, I think this, I think the problem is not with our expectations or with your expectation. The problem is with the location of your expectation. So, so the, the problem is not with your expectation. The problem is with the location of your expectation. But, but listen, think about this. What, what, what if the point of, of your disappointments, and, and listen, what, what if the point of the disappointment what was to point you to the one who never disappoints? It, what if the, the point of, of that letdown, of, of that moment where you realize, hey, I, I thought I married Rachel, I woke up to Leah, I thought I married Fabio, I woke up to Ed, and, and this, that moment of unmet expectations, what, what if that was meant to actually push you to the real source of happiness, to, to the real source of joy? What if the point of marriage wasn't just about making me happy, but was to help me realize how much I need God? What if the disappointment was meant to help you realize that only God can be that for you? Yeah, I'm telling you, it changes everything. So I want to wrap up with this. I'm going to invite Chris up um, to, to kind of start to close this out. But, but there's, there's one more section in this story that, that I think is, is, is pertinent to this. And it's interesting. After all this, she realizes, you know, she'd been trying to get her fulfillment, trying to get her satisfaction, uh, from, from Jacob, from this marriage, from this relationship, from trying to, um, you know, live out all these different expectations and dreams and only to kind of have those keep falling short. And she finds this fulfillment. She finds this satisfaction in God. And it's interesting because it, later on at the end of Genesis 30, it gets to a point where, where, where she um, names her son, names her son Joseph. Now, that's really interesting here because most of the time when someone gets named something in the Bible, it's descriptive of kind of who they are. You know, kind of like Leah. Leah wasn't like the most attractive in there, and so, you know, her name was kind of descriptive of kind of how they had seen her. Well, the, the same thing typically goes with this, but, but this name is different, though. See, this name that she applies to their son isn't descriptive of the person. It's actually descriptive of God. She, she names her son, get this, Joseph, which in Hebrew means Yahweh will add to it. Yahweh will add to it. In other words, God took my pain away. That's the statement. And here's his name. He's not done yet. I love that. I mean, you get that. Basically, that's what she's saying. He's not done yet. I couldn't have children, but now I just had a baby boy, and I'm so grateful for what God has done. He's brought us through the hardest thing we could have ever imagined, the hardest season we could have ever thought we would go through. And yet God was there. And so his name is God. He's just getting started. Listen, Yahweh will add to it. God's not done yet. God's just beginning to do a work on our marriage, in our life, in our, in our church, in our place. Listen, I don't know what the situation looks like, but you've got to get to a place where at some point you, didn't, you can declare, you can prophesy Joseph over your marriage. Joseph over your future, Joseph over your career, Joseph over your dreams. Maybe you've been divorced and you need to declare that God's not done yet with me, right? Listen, you got to get to that place where we shift our focus of trying to get everybody around us to try to meet some need that they were never meant to meet in the first place. Only God was meant to meet that and get to that place where, again, we were able to proclaim Joseph over our lives. Maybe you've walked through some difficulty, and you need to be able to have the faith to look forward and say, God isn't finished yet with me. What he brought me from is, is not where I'm going. God is still at work. He's going to add to it. He's going to keep working. It's not over yet. He's just getting started. See, see this isn't about lowering your expectations when it comes to marriage. 
lowering your expectations when it comes to a relationship, lowering your expectations when it comes to life or career or dream. It's actually just the opposite. It's about raising it from just settling for mediocre to miraculous. It's about raising the level of your expectations so high that it can only be met if God gets involved. In fact, I put in my notes this way. You, you and I, we've got to raise your expectations for your marriage until the only way it can meet them is if God is in the middle of it. See, you should expect a marriage so miraculous that doesn't make sense unless God, God steps into it. You should have expectations so high that, 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 you know, good and well, he can't do that for us. I can't do that for us. Only God could do this for us. We've got to raise our expectations. We've got to move from grading expectations to a great expectation that's found only when we get God involved and we look to God as the source of our fulfillment, our strength, our joy, our help in whatever situation you're in whether it be marital, whether it be relationship, whether it be career, whether it be with a dream. Every about, every eye closed, I want to pray for you.